meetings, but I wanted to introduce myself as the Executive Director of the Brackenridge Park Conservancy and to say just a few brief words about the Conservancy. We were formed as a nonprofit organization in 2008 and were organized to be a steward for uh, a steward of and advocate for the park to work with you the community to represent you and work with the city uh, as a partner in what might be improved at the park what needs to uh, be sustained and what could be and enhanced to improve all of our visitor experiences as we walk through the park. Um, the Conservancy operates under a memorandum of understanding with the City of San Antonio. However, we do not manage or operate the park. We are, an advisory, um, it, we are in our advisory capacity in working with the City and the community. Um, it's important, I think, that we are all talking about Brackenridge Park now. Um, it's time. Our much-loved park is visited um, throughout the year by people from throughout the city, not just one district or, no, or district two, but it, it is uh, unable to keep up with the heavy usage. So part of the reason we are all here is to see how can we adapt to what is needed for the park, for instance, maintaining river walls or um, restoring the pump house, which uh, Homer will go into. But the purpose is not for us to end the discussion. This is the beginning of the discussion about what is going to happen long term to the park. And it's up to us as citizens. And so I put myself out there and members of the Conservancy are here tonight to talk with you, answer um, additional questions, and hear your comments. And I look forward to working with you over time. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. So I'm going to provide a, a summary, an overview of just the process and some of these strategies to date. And then uh, once we're done, uh, we'll go into citizens that signed up to speak. And then after that, it'll be an open house forum where you can circulate and rotate through the different strategy areas to ask additional questions uh, of the project team. Uh, but kind of want to highlight sort of you know, how we got here. So obviously, we have strategies to share with the public. And through the process, uh, the community and, and uh, former Councilman Betty Osabo reached out to Councilman um, Trevino of District 1, highlighting the need for additional public input. And so the Parks Department was challenged to do just that. And we want to be responsive to the community. And so tonight is one of six public meetings. After this evening, where there's two public meetings left, for uh, citizens to come out and continue to provide input through this process. And so at this point, um, nothing's been decided. No plan has been adopted. These strategies you see are just that. They're concept ideas. No design elements have been considered. This is not an implementation plan. There is no funding for this project. There's funding to develop the master plan, but no funding for implementation. We're not working with a blank slate, so that's challenging for the project team to go through and figure out how we can improve this park. At the end of the day, public use of this park will not change. There's been some misinformation about fees being charged, and Easter camping going away. That's not accurate. This master plan does not address programming in the park. What it does is it addresses how we can protect, preserve, and restore the cultural and historical resources of the park. And that was the overarching goal and so what these everybody's holding and what these vision boards have in the back has that in mind and so through this process at the end of the sixth meeting the design team will be charged with putting all that information together and figuring out which of these strategies ultimately move move forward and maybe become part of a final recommendation so 
First off, strategy number one, increase visibility and pedestrian access to and within the park. And so you see three kind of subcomponents that make that up. And depending on where you're coming from, or if you're a tourist or not, you may get to the park a different way, or if you're a tourist, you may not know that you just passed Breckenridge Park. And so one uh, theme was, or one element was to create a common park entrance and theme so that depending how you're accessing the park, you'll know you've arrived at Breckenridge Park. Um, there's a lot of neighborhoods that surround the park. And so uh, research showed that there was poor pedestrian connectivity to the park. And so there's opportunity to strengthen that. You see in uh, one of the, the vision elements for number one, the third one, talks about adding multi-use pathways to increase pedestrian flow. One of the comments that we've heard is how can we increase safety of pedestrian traffic north and south of the park, east and west. And so this in part addresses that. Second, recapture green space and lieu of impervious cover and parking. Through asset mapping of the park by the project team, one of the things that they shared with us which is that 20% of the park is impervious cover, whether that's rooftops or surface lots. One-fifth of the park impervious cover. So how can we recapture green space in lieu of that? And there's four elements on how that can be accomplished. First is to uh, reduce interior parking and excess impervious cover to recapture some green space. That doesn't mean all parking in the park will go away, just at strategic, maybe uh, stress points within the park. That's where we look at and focus implementing this part or this vision. 2B, establish parking garages on the perimeter of the park. That, you'll see, uh, relates directly to 2C. The large surface lot in the park as it exists today is right by the Breckenridge Eagle, the train depot. And so by recapturing that impervious cover as green space, a grand lawn, the parking has to go somewhere. And so the project team identified opportunities along the perimeter of the park, not on parkland, that garages could potentially be developed. And so Obviously, if we have parking along the perimeter with limited parking on the interior, then there's a need to get people to and from points of interest. And so one possibility is through providing what is referred to as a people mover or a tram of sorts. Number three, restore natural park features and improve water quality. So there's four components there that uh, work towards this end. First being restore and stabilize the San Antonio riverbanks. One of the things that the, the project team identified, apart from the impervious cover ratio, is it's a large park with a vast portfolio of features, amenities, and assets. With that comes high maintenance costs. So the stabilization of San Antonio Riverbanks is something the department's doing now, but maybe there's more we can do in that regard. So this looks at that. Along the east side of the park is the Catalpa Pershing Channel, which basically is a man-made concrete channel. And so one way is to soften that look, restore it so it still functions, as a channel, but do it in a way with the natural design and pedestrian walkways. There's a lot of uh, invasive species. This is not unique to Brackenridge Park. We encounter this in many of our parks and natural areas. So this is also a strategy to restore natural park features. How do we better manage our invasive species and eradication? And while we do any development, whether it's new development 
or a retrofit, look at including low impact development features. Number four, restore, preserve, and articulate park cultural and historical features. This directly ties back to what the purpose of this master plan is, to protect, preserve, and restore the cultural and historical landscape of this park. So in, in 4A, it talks about basically raising the profile of the park, achieving a certain designation that doesn't exist today with this park that will lend itself to possibly outside funding, non-city funding, to accomplish just this, preserve, protect, and restore these critical features of the park. We know that there is um, a lot of history of the park with Spanish colloquial dams, acequias, and, and waterworks. And so one, one element of this strategy is to look at how we can restore those to provide an understanding for future generations of how this park was once used versus to how it is today. There's a number, a multitude of historic buildings and structures on, on the property that also, through restoration, can again tell the story of how the park's use has changed over time. Create an outdoor classroom. There's a lot of education activities that occur in the park today, throughout the park, but there's an opportunity as well to have a formal area where this occurs. There's a sunken garden theater, serves as a, a venue for many events throughout the year, and how do we better integrate this into the park? So one element looks at renovating the sunken garden theater. The fifth and final strategy, reduce vehicular traffic to improve pedestrian mobility. This ties back to the first one, talking about pedestrian connectivity and, and safe passage to, you know, north and south, east and west within the park. And so, you know, and, and also back to having a common park entrance. So there's many ways you can get to Breckenridge Park. This first one um, talks about Improving the intersection at Stadium Drive and Hildebrand Avenue and having that be as a formal park entrance and a formal zoo entrance. Typically, people will come up St. Mary's to get to the zoo, um, but this would bring them down a different route. And so, again, people know we've arrived at Brackenridge Park. 5B. This ties back to the first one about, so with that entrance being solidified and directing traffic as a formal entrance to the park, there's the opportunity to look at closing the Hildebrand Avenue entrance on the northern end of the park where there's an abundance of historical assets. And five C and D highlight possibly mid-block mid turnarounds along Red Oak and Tulita and St. Mary's. These roundabouts would allow people to still drive up to the designated point of interest within the park, offload, load up at the end of the day, whatever the case may be, and not have that traffic coming through the park. 5E. Close Avenue A to public vehicular traffic and allow this similar to, you know, we talk about um, Katapa Pershing and kind of restoring that as a natural feature, allow this area to become an, uh, a natural area with pedestrian walkway. And so those are the five primary strategies of where we're at thus far in the master plan development process. Good evening, everyone. Um, my questions were related, or my comments related, mostly to mobility. Um, I work with 
a senior population. Some of our events occur at Brackenridge Park and there have been opportunities for vehicles to go into the park, drop off our seniors, park elsewhere. Oh. My question is, will this limit those types of events for um, organizations that want to do that, you know, just to, to bring in a day trip or a field trip or whatever um, to, um, to the seniors, to the senior population? Um, and also to impaired visitors who are in either scooters, wheelchairs, or other types of devices that assist them in walking. Um, as well as renovations, will renovations limit the entrances of those special transit vehicles? And I know that I spoke with Bill about some of those and he assured that, you know, because of federal compliance, ADA um, accommodations have, need to be made for those types of vehicles. Uh, and also, uh, uh, something, a uh, last uh, comment. Will the existing and renovate, recently renovated pavilions still remain on site? Joski's, Kaler, all of those. Will those still remain on site for groups or individuals to use? Thank you. Regarding the process um, and letting people know what you're doing, I've handed out probably 150, 200 flyers to people who really use the park. I walk around the park, I go every day for two miles, and I've handed out flyers, 200, at least 200. And I have yet to hand a flyer to anybody that knew what you guys are doing. So the real users of the park do not know what you are doing. And the Brackenridge Park Conservancy that's supposed to be a voice, and I'm quoting, a voice for those who use this treasured park, end quote, is dedicated to representing the interests of the park users. That is an incorrect statement because the real park users do not know what you guys are doing. And with the 4th of July coming up, that would be a really good time for you all to go out there with your staff and your people and hand out flyers to all the real users of the park and ask them what they think of what you're talking about doing. As far as pervious cover, I'd like to know where you get the 20% from because I've looked at your map and I don't see how it's possible that 20% is the case. But if it is, you can use pavers. You can dig up the, co the pavement and the concrete and the asphalt. You can put down pavers. You can put down pervious concrete that water goes through. You could even put grass and mow the roads through the park but allow cars to drive over them. You could put real grass roofs on top of all the roofs that you're saying are a problem. Um, uh, all I would say about driving through the park is like on Avenue A and, and all the whole park, you're, you're going to stop Grandpa from going down there and fishing with his kids on the banks. You're going to stop people like me who like to just slowly drive through my park. You're going to stop all the picnickers and campers that like to go in the park and don't have all day long, don't have time to park in a parking garage and ride a tram to go picnic. So you are going to restrict the people's use of their park. If there were not people like myself and my cousin and others who decided to block walk and hand out flyers at Brackenridge Park for all the people that utilize the park, most people would not know that this even existed. So for individuals to stand up here and say, well, nothing is permanent, this is a draft plan, well, I have to differ because this plan was already in the works. It was already being spoken of. They were already moving forward until a grassroots individual decided to bring it to light and say why we as a community, as a staple of this city, were not aware of this master plan. So please take that into light as they want to say draft plan. Um, there are a lot of positives, but one thing that I do not want to see are parking garages. I think that, you know, you're going to place everybody in a parking garage that has to potentially pay because they did it downtown San Antonio. Um, so who is that really going to keep out of the park? We all know that Pearl is being, is a new concept and you have the Alamo Heights area, um, but is that really going to prevent all the people 
that have used this park for generations. This is a staple of our city from actually accessing and making this an accessible park. There are a lot of cultural elements to this park that we do need to cherish and we need to continue because that is what makes our city so unique is the culture as well as this park. So I want to clarify that this, yes, is a, though it's being presented that now our community input is wanted, this was after the fact. Thank you all very much and have a good evening. density because I know this park like the back of my hand so if anybody who actually drops off children at an incarnate word on Hildebrand all know that you have a backup from UIW high school so if they plan on I believe that's your strategy five if they plan on making that a singular entrance could you all see Hildebrand being backed up on that high hill and coming down and uh, having all that traffic back up and say, oh, this is your main entrance? For people who are not from San Antonio, because that's really who we're catering to, it seems like, are the, are the tourists, is what's been happening for decades, is that uh, people coming down Hildebrand Hill and going on to 281, if you miss that exit, that's it. You have to go back around. There is no accessible way of walking into that entrance. So that was just my additional comment. Thank you. I actually um, love some of the new creative improvements that um, will enhance the beauty of the park, like the uh, modern drainage designs, um, the stabilization of riverbanks, um, and you know, just um, just the vision for for improving, of course, the qual the water quality of our rivers and streams throughout the entire San Antonio is um, important. Um, you mentioned like the cost of um, maintaining the parks is expensive, um, and definitely um, cleaning up the rivers and everything, the streams. It's definitely a, a hard work, but it's definitely an investment um, that I think is well worth. Um, and uh, that said though, um, I did not like the um, elimination of the roads that go into the park. Um, as because I, I, I represent the working families of San Antonio and and sometimes it's just really hard to find you know an hour of block of your time to, to go to the park I understand like there's a concern of the that maybe lack of parking and, and concerns about congestion in the within the park and maybe wanting to use more um, multi like wanting to use more pedestrian friendly spaces so so I think I know recently they, the city spent money to improve the roads, so it would be a waste of money just to completely dig out like all of the the asphalt to turn into to green space. I know that it's um, we want more green spaces, but I think that by keeping people out of the park is not the the answer to that. The answer to that. The answer. I'm just here because I got an email. And it was very scary because I thought there would be no way you could enter unless you paid. And there would be a lot of things in there, I guess, like the tram or whatever you have to pay. And now you don't have to. You can walk in or take a bike or take a car. And I, I really would not like to see that changed. Thank you. I have a child with special needs and disabilities. I represent Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. I'm a part of Knights of Columbus. I'm also bear, uh, part of the Berhar 269 Alhambras. We give back to the disabled uh, folks, uh, kiddos that are uh, fortunate that uh, it's hard for them to walk. Uh, we work a lot closely with the, with the zoo itself and we have certain recreations that they have or certain centers that they put together for uh, uh, Brackenbridge. 
which is a little bit difficult for these kiddos and not only for kids but also for uh, elders that are in wheelchair uh, mobility. It's very hard and very inconvenient for them to get out from the vehicle, finding parking for the disabled. Uh, sometimes we have to drive around four to five times around the park to actually find a parking for the disabled. So it's really hard to actually be on time in a certain location there with our agency or organization or even with the families of these kiddos and uh, such as in my case. Uh, my wife's a teacher. I know she loves going out there and bringing other families on board to try to, you know, just have a fun time at BRAC and try to figure out ideas of how we can come together and basically just enjoy a nice little picnic, you know, and putting things together for the family. But, uh, you know, some of, the, some of those are main concerns, such as the, I know you have the, the parking and the shades and all that other stuff that you want to go ahead and bring in sight. But I think, uh, you know, utilizing that, it's really hard to come by with uh, being really culture here in San Antonio with the whole breaking down the streets and doing this and that. You know, there's a certain way to do it, but that kind of takes away from the value of what San Antonio and the cultura is all about. That's what keeps me here in San Antonio, Texas. Not going back to Los Angeles, but at the same time, just meeting some of these historical landmarks that a lot of people are unaware, just like La Villita. I know I was also, uh, you know, uh, against all that prop uh, proposition, but anyhow, that's a different scenario. But some of the other things that I uh, wanted to bring up was also, uh, uh, such as, uh, I believe you have a, a trolley or something there in one of your uh, forums there, then, you know, if that's going to be in sight for the, for the whole Bracken Bridge, such a little trolley park or something like that, I think it would be great to have a little something with the disabled, for the disabled to also enjoy that. Because I know I personally had to make a request with the zoo for our kiddo to actually bring out a certain train at Brack to actually just ride that train for, what is it, 15 or like actually less than a few minutes or so. And it was really hard for us to actually make that come to life. And while we were there actually making that request, uh, I believe they mentioned, well, this is the only little train that we have. It's been here for years, but this is something new that we brought up. And it's only unfortunate that it's only one uh, ramp that we have for those that are disabled. And uh, I just think we just need more of that especially for you know kids elders and any way of uh having disabilities so that way they could get around the park and all that so i just want to thank you guys once again for having us here but uh, that's something i wanted to bring up thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Uh, my main concern is about sunken gardens theater i'm a user of that theater pr pretty much once a year and my concern is about the renovation of the uh, park itself and also uh, the parking around the uh, the park and the street closure, which can uh, also put a damper on what we do out there at the park. And we put a, a lot of money into the park and there's hardly anything that's been done uh, to the structure outside of the park. I saw uh, this past year they did a lot of improvement as far as the, uh, the outside structure and putting plants in, not a pretty looking uh, flowers and so forth and so on uh, inside of the park, but also uh, the seating in the Sucking Garden Theater is still not, um, has been not been uh, replenished. Uh, they've been taking seats out, of course, for various reasons. Uh, when they break, they don't uh, put them back in. But um, there are a lot of things that, that I've seen that since we've been using the park for some 30 some odd years that has not been improved. And I'm just concerned about the uh, the closing of the streets and and the parking around something Gardens Theater, but uh, that's those are my concerns and hope that we can get some of those resolved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. For those of you who are not familiar with uh, what parkour is, it's a movement-based discipline, a holistic approach to self-improvement through physical and mental challenges. Um, our community has grown over the past ten plus years, and we use any number of San Antonio parks for our training and uh, with our unique background and skills um, trained at these local parks it allows us to grow and invest in the betterment of our community its members and its environment our practitioners develop a symbiotic relationship with 
the natural and man-made obstacles. Um, the environment directly affects uh, the progress that we make as humans. Um, we are, uh, I'm here to express the importance of preservation alongside with innovation and some of the restoration projects that you have in place would take away from the obstacles that we use every day. Uh, we want to give back and we want to help because this is really important to us, but we also ask that you take into consideration um, the way that uh, other people use the park as well for enjoyment and training. And uh, thank you so much for having this. We really appreciate everything. And if there's anything we can do to give back, just let us know. This will spend a lot of our taxpayer money. It will be totally renovated, up to date, top of the line, and then it will be privatized. And you will never get back in the door without paying some private group to use our public facility. So I'd like this entire thing to start from scratch and start with the public in a public park. A park does not include fees for anything. Thank you. Thank you. As much as I have seen, and we have seen as an organization about policy making and policy change, we are also seeing a lot of this uh, development coming across with plans like the SA Tomorrow, the comprehensive plan, even SA 2020, where we're seeing that a lot of these things are changes are for looking out for the future residents in the next 10 years. However, it also disregards the current residents and the past residents of San Antonio. Um, so one of the biggest change when it comes to policy making is that these plans are the initiatives, kind of initiative conversations about erasing current residents. We're thinking about new garages that talk about parking where we don't even know if they're going to be charging up to $5 or $10 per hour. We're talking about garages that are occupation of public or even housing. We're talking about house people that are being displaced as it is off of Broadway Street where they can't even afford the rent or even the mortgages because people are buying up houses and charging a lot. And I do travel across Mulberry Street into the park onto Broadway and I already know how heavily trafficked it is and uh, it does not talk about that at this point. I mean I know it's, it's like the conversation of that but I do want to see the improvements off of that. I do see a lot of the focus actually how the Pearl Brewery and this park are going to be connected with the new residents because it is going to be an accommodation for them but not for us. And uh, as far as pedestrian walk it is very dangerous to walk around Broadway and to even let alone cross it during the day and even at night because people actually, you know, will go across the street to buy something to eat or come back. Um, the, there's a lot of traffic up on Hildebrand, definitely. I do see that a lot because of the schools. And um, we do get worried when it comes to policy. We do get worried about plans because, uh, again, as an organization, we do uh, respect and honor uh, past uh, generations and the new generations. Do not remove access to the park. Do not touch one of those drives. Do not remove one of those individual two, three, four parking places that are close to the picnic tables. I've used the park regularly for over 50 years. That's my park. It's our park. It's their park. And what the things that you need to keep in mind is there are a number of us here, but for every one person who is speaking, you know statistically how many other people there are out there that are not coming forth and saying what they think and feel, but share a sentiment. You guys know statistics. What I would suggest that you do is go back to the drawing table. One, do not use Pearl as an example. That development has hidden the jewel of the Pearl Brewery so that those of us who live here can't see it. You talk about access, it's not there. You need to look at this park in the terms of improving what nature has had. I agree, you know, put more pecan trees back there. Take out some of the growth that has strangled the native growth. Improve the little roadways, some of that has been done. Put more access to restroom facilities 
So as you're walking or running or biking and nature calls, you can get to a facility quickly. Put in more water fountains with pet fountains attached so that when you have your pets, and I've got two dogs and I take them out there, that when they need something to drink, you can get something to drink and soak in your pets. I have seen that done in different areas along the San Antonio River development. We need to have more of that. It's not a big scientific issue. And you need to also look at accessibility for those that have mobility issues. I remember wheeling my mother around in her wheelchair and thumpity, 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 thumpity. So use what you have. Do not destroy what we have. Now, there is a multi-level parking. I think it's on Avenue A. It's the street that runs parallel to Broadway, one block over. Avenue B. Avenue B. And it's tucked away. It's close to the Witty. That is done very well. You have natural vines growing along the outside of it. It is free. You don't even know it's there because it's so well camouflaged with the trees. And I think it's like four levels. And that's a very good example of using the natural area to improve parking in the area. That large expanse over there where the, um, um, the little train has the stop for the zoo, that very large area of asphalt. And I was looking at it the other day and I thought, you know, with some really good ecological designs, you could have several of those parking areas in that. You could diminish some of the asphalt area, put more trees back, and you would have some vertical parking, but right there where it's accessible. So again, so you don't have to schlep stuff back and forth. This idea of having perimeter parking and having to come into our park, forget that, folks. It sucks. Remember, we are the people. This is our park. It is a people's park. Please respect the people who live in this community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Breckenridge Park is personal to me. When my grandmother came here in the early 1900s, escaping the revolution in Mexico, um, she raised her family to enjoy the park. I had my second birthday there in 1952. The family, all the cousins, just got in a station wagon and took a blanket and got under a tree and sang happy birthday to me. So um, there are long, long, deep, deep roots for the community to have free access to the parks. I understand that y'all are not addressing fees, that you want to charge people to go to our free park. That needs to be struck down from the very beginning. Not for parking, not for access to water to drink, not for access to a tram, if y'all are indeed going to put this tram into place. Okay, I don't see picnic tables in your pretty pictures. Um, in my family, that's the main reason we went to the park, for picnics. Uh, we bring something from home, maybe get some chicken, maybe get something to drink, and uh, just spend the afternoon. There are some other concerns. There seems to be an understanding that the European influence is the most important aspect of the park. As it has been said earlier, thank you, um, Yanawana, the people who were here well before the, the barbarians from Spain arrived, uh, used these spaces first. So it's interesting that you want to restore and interpret Spanish colonial dams, acequias, and waterworks. But it would also be good for y'all to bear very much in mind the importance of the people who were here first and acknowledge the culture and the heritage of the Yanawana. So if this is not going to be a place 
where every day San Antonio's can go and have a picnic, where we can have access to take a picnic to, uh, bundle in and sit under a tree or preferably at a picnic table. If y'all are going to charge us for any of that, uh, that won't fly. So this cannot be another gentrification project that keeps the real people who grew up here, whose parents grew up here, whose grandparents grew up here, and whose great-grandparents came in from Mexico. And we're recent arrivals, so I know there are people who have been here many more generations than my family. And, and you all need to take care of it for my family, and for my family's families, and my family's neighbors, and the cousin across the fence that's married to the man down the street. <laughs> So keep it, keep it San Antonio. Keep it Yanawana. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Amelia Valdez, and I am a staff at the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, who was uh, last night a part of the uh, session at the Guadalupe Theater. And uh, our concern it was similar to what everybody's talking about. And then what came out of that meeting was, why fix something that doesn't need to be fixed? I want to invite you all to a little modest little park that needs a lot of work. And my family took care of it, and my family before my family took care of it, and that's Casiano Park, 1718, South South Samora. Fact. Kids get stickers or thorns in their feet. Fact. The swimming pool ball wall has been tagged. Fact, one toilet to about maybe a hundred people. Fact, a dirty creek. Fact, a playground that gets about a hundred and something degrees that's really hot. Fact, people come there every day to have fun, to be with their families, to be with their gentes. We got a 345 acre park that does not need to be put through whatever changes you need to be put on. But let's fix our other parks. The city belongs to the city, right? Belongs to the community, MLK Park. Other small parks in the community that really need work. So I wanna invite everybody, Councilman Warwick, come to the west side of San Antonio. Come see Casiano Park other parks, Smith Park, other little parks that just need something. Just need something minor, right? Uh, it doesn't need a lot of work. And as a part of the uh, staff of Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, uh, we want to make sure things are going to be done right. We want the community to have access to any of the planning, and also we want to make sure that we as a community are being notified and we visit other parks too. It's just not Breckenridge Park. It's, it's, it's a part of our culture, yes. But we also need other areas that need to be also be looked at because um, we don't want uh, kids to be hurt at a place that, you know, you know that right as, this, as I speak. And it's, I would be embarrassed for people to come through Casiano Park and see all the tagging that's up there at the park. But it's a beautiful little park. I can only say that at night it glows of how much richness of people that come to that park. So yes, Brackenridge Park might need its minor, but it doesn't need what other parks really need. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Stickers? Yeah, no. No, yeah. no. Okay, so we're, we're looking for your feedback as far as strongly agree or strongly disagree to any of the proposals that you heard tonight. So we need everyone to place one sticker on each item 
on their opinion from that anywhere on that spectrum. There's about five different choices that you have from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And we that feedback's gonna be tallied up for all the different sides of town that we're going to, and we're gonna uh, share this information with the rest of our council colleagues. Again, Councilman Trevino and myself share Breckenridge Park. It is in District 2, the, uh, most of the areas where the changes are uh, being proposed. And again, we're here to listen. Uh, please don't think that we're doing this as a waste of time and we're not gonna take this information that is broadcast for the entire world to see and ignore it. Um, that is not how we operate with the city of San Antonio. That's not how I operate as a council person. And I do appreciate everything that we've heard, not just at this conversation, but in previous emails and previous conversations, and whenever you see me on the street when people bring this um, instance up. So again, I'll be here as well afterwards. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know that you have families to get back to, but I do thank you again for coming out and sharing uh, how you feel about the park. Your passion for the park is, uh, it shines through with many of your comments, and uh, a lot of those memories that you had I have as well because I, I remember the park the same way. We would very much like to hear when you're going to begin the community input planning meetings. Well, again, this uh, potential work was scheduled to be uh, done in phases, potentially not all of it, potentially some of it, depending on what went through the bond committees. So the bond process starts in November. Most likely this would happen before November. So we do not want to pay for something that we have not yet designed. Uh, there's no way to pay for it without, if, you, if, if, if the project even moves forward to a bond process in its current state, which is probably uh, highly unlikely based on the feedback that we've gotten, um, then you vote no and you won't be paying for it. The, and if the entire city will probably vote no. There's no reason for us to put out a package that would damage all of the other potential bond packages. You understand? So we, we want the bond to pass. We want to make investments in our city. We need streets, sidewalks, drainage, uh, facilities like libraries and senior centers in all parts of town. And to let one project uh, move forward that could potentially damage or stop those other projects from happening is not going to happen. Does that make sense to you? It does in a sense of Austin constantly works with their communities, asks them what you want us to do. We do not yet have that process here, and we better hurry up and get that process. That's well, I think this is a part of that process, and again, we're, we're coming into our own and how we're doing it, but I think this is us asking you what, what you want, and again, we're asking for your feedback back on those walls. We ask for your feedback on this microphone, and we're saving and sharing your feedback, so if you go to Nowcast SA, you'll be able to see this for all of eternity, at least as long as the internet exists. So uh, I don't think that there's any problem with... Uh, it, the timing's a little off. I do agree we, we should have asked earlier. And, and we're okay. It's okay to uh, make mistakes as long as we admit to them and, and make a change as quickly as possible. So again, this is uh, still plenty of time before November, before we even start looking, because the final bond packages start in November. They don't end in November. So then the final packages are uh, approved by council in January. Uh, more or less January. And then we start selling them to the public uh, for the May election of 2017. So we're almost a year out from the actual process. So this is still fairly early. And again, no ground has been broken. Nothing has occurred that, can, that can't be turned back. Um, we're, we're, these are just uh, drawings on this paper. I was asked a year ago to attend a meeting. So, I mean, it's been there, there, no, there, there have been since meetings. last July. There have been meetings, have been but I think that, I, 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 because I went to two meetings as well. I was at TriPoint, I was at a, another meeting. But it, again, I don't think the way that it, it was publicized is, and, and it's not just this program, it's a lot of city programs. If you look at Stand Up SA, or uh, not Stand Up SA, Speak Up SA, uh, 10,000 or 15,000 out of 2 million people, I don't think that's acceptable to move forward with any kind of plan. But what does it take to get our people out to? It, it takes almost a fear, this is like a fear scenario. We're gonna take the park away so you come out. But you guys should already be out of the meeting. Because the meetings did happen. We didn't hide the meetings. They're at public places, places, venues larger than this one. But because that fear factor came in, we got more people out. It's like the Donald Trump thing. You know, people are now registering to vote that have never registered because they're scared that this person is going to uh, potentially be the president of our, our country. It, it, it shouldn't have to come to that. We, we want more engaged citizens 
and uh, hopefully we can get more gay citizens out of, out of this progress. Well, I think it's different because you can do that with the Hemisphere Park. You guys I, I was not a council person during that process. I, I cannot. Well, the city council kept that on the wrap so we wouldn't have an election. Uh, it, so I'm feeling that's what y'all trying to do here with Brackenridge. Yeah. It, the, yep. the state legislature. Because y'all asking for input, but it seems like your mind's already made up. Yep. So I, we can give you all the input you want, but like your mind's made up what you want to do with this park. I attended that meeting a year ago in July, and I was really blown away by the 30 to 40 different ideas that people came up and said, I want to see this in my park. I don't want you to take away cars in the park. I want you to make sure the Feral Cat Coalition is taken care of in the park. So many people came and spoke up for positive things that they wanted to see and what they didn't want taken away in their, their family life and how important it was. And that was a year ago. They went through, they made themselves available. You could email, you could call, you could talk to them. I called Jim Gray, he was wonderful at you know, answering my questions if I had any. And they presented it, I believe, around April, kind of, you know, a culmination. And I really thought then, well, they really heard a lot of those different opinions and people and tried to address those. I don't think you're getting some of the nitty gritty in, in this presentation because I know there was a plan for a pecan grove um, in, in the, the bigger thing that I saw. But I was so inspired by that that I joined the Conservancy because I, I work by the park every day. And, and so after the Easter camping, which I love that that's a tradition. It's, you know, sometimes I feel I'm not a real person because I didn't grow up here, but I love the park and I love those traditions and, and seeing that the Conservancy takes the time to like go out Monday and pick up trash and doing things, you know, they still respect it, but they want to, to still take care of the park. So I feel a little bit like there was a little bit of a bad rap tonight yeah. with some of the things that went on. But I do appreciate, again, everyone's passion about the subject. Obviously, this is not going to be the last conversation that we have on the topic. And I look forward to meeting with my constituents and constituents from all over the city because, again, uh, the majority of the area of the park that uh, the master plan deals with is in District 2. So I look forward to talking to all of you about it.